since we have um, studied Colossians together. So I thought it'd be good just to have a quick recap on where we've got to so far and what the, kind of what the story is so far. So many of you might remember that um, the book of Colossians we know is not a book so much as it is a letter, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to this church in Colossae, which is a place in sort of central um, Turkey, uh, a place that Paul never went to, a church that he didn't plant but a church that a chap named Epaphras probably planted. And Epaphras is right now, while Paul is writing this letter, in prison with Paul in Rome. And so Paul is writing this letter to this group of people he's never met based on the report that Epaphras has brought to him from a prison cell. And Paul is writing to these people to encourage them and to warn them about the dangers of false teaching, but to encourage them to embrace Christ, to remind them of who he is, and to remind them of who they are in him. And really, that's what we will see tonight. Paul really will, in earnest, begin to remind this church of who they are in Christ. So you may remember at the end of chapter two, so this was about two or three weeks ago now, we got to the end of chapter two, and we left off there after we found out that Paul was writing against the false teaching of a kind of like shamanistic type character who was seeking to it all, or who had already worked his way into the church at Colossae and begun to influence the people there. And he'd come in with all these kinds of extra teachings, a little bit of like pseudo-Jewish teachings, a lot of paganism, all wrapped up in enough Christian language to make it sound good. And he was trying to sell this to the church at Colossae, trying to get them to buy into his way of kind of doing faith, uh, which was a lot was very legalistic, a lot of rules to keep. You must do it this way, you must do it that way. Uh, and this was a guy who was claiming to have sort of special revelation, special hidden knowledge that only he had access to. And because he had access to that, he was then judging those in the church around them who didn't have access to this special knowledge, this revelation that he has got from a pagan source. And he'd begun to kind of dismiss people, disqualify people, sort of judging them, saying, well, you can't really be a Christian if you don't understand this, or you can't be a Christian because you're not keeping these rules. And so Paul had kind of warned against this person. And we left off chapter two with this warning uh, that said, that legalistic way of thinking, that rules-keeping mentality, that religious spirit that this guy is trying to influence this church with, is useless in bringing transformation. Paul says it's useless in bringing transformation. It won't change you. Keeping a set of rules will not produce righteousness in you because it will not bring about the proper heart-level transformation that empowers you to change your attitude and your behavior as well. And we kind of ended on a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of chapter 2. It was a bit of a downer, really, wasn't it? Because Paul had um, started kind of pulling this apart, and he just left us on this uh, at the end of chapter 2 with this sense of, well, you know, you can't keep the rules, and that's not going to bring about transformation. So what we'll see now is that Paul, in the start of chapter 3, will begin to shift his focus off of warning against these false teachers and onto calling the church at Colossae into who they've been created to be in Christ Jesus. He's going to start calling them up to their identity so that they can live out their calling according to that identity, so they can walk out that life that glorifies Jesus because of who he has made them to be. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit in these first 10, chap uh, first 10 verses of chapter 3. So let's read now from um, verse 1 in chapter 3, and I'm going to read from the ESV translation. So if it sounds a little bit different in your Bible, that's okay, because you might just not have the same translation as mine. So verse 1 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So what we'll see as we go through this is that in these first four verses, when Paul talks about um, 
being raised with Christ and being hidden with him, he's beginning to build that bridge and switch his approach from addressing those false teachings that he's just looked at in chapter 2 into calling these people up into that identity. So back in the opening lines of his letter, Paul kind of tips his hand to what he's about to do here in this part of his letter. In verse um, 2 of chapter 1, he, uh, he writes this. This is who he's addressing the, the letter to. He says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. And right at the start of this letter, he's making a statement not only about the identity of his audience, that they are saints and holy ones of God, but that while their location may be at Colossae, their identity and their standing and their status is in Christ. In Christ. And we're going to see that come up all the way through the scripture that we've looked at just now. And the same is true for us today. You know, whilst we might be um, in the natural believers and followers of Jesus here at Lincoln, we are also, just as they were at Colossae, in Christ. In Christ. Your identity is in Christ and your citizenship is in heaven even while your location is here on earth. And as Paul will begin to develop, the reality of that should radically, radically alter the way that we live our lives. So, I don't know, some of you may be immigrants to this country. I know at least some of you will be um, immigrants to this country. You'll be living in to what to you may feel like a foreign country. Um, I've never done that myself, but I have had the privilege of traveling to a number of countries around the world. I've traveled to a few different countries, mainly in Europe, but occasionally a bit further afield than that. And uh, I've had the opportunity to go to um, Thailand, was probably the furthest afield I've been. It's about an 18-hour flight, and it's fair, quite a long way around the world. And um, Helen and I went to Thailand about 10 years ago. And when we arrived, everything was different. Everything was different. You know, it looked different. The colors looked different. I mean, maybe that was just after the 18-hour flight, but the colors looked different. You know, it smelled different. The food was different. The traffic was really different. Oh, my goodness, the traffic was different. Bangkok was crazy. But um, it all looked different. The whole culture was different. And, you know, the, the, when we arrived, the day we arrived, so we flew and we arrived uh, uh, in Bangkok at half past six in the morning. We couldn't get into our hotel until four o'clock in the evening. We'd been awake for about 18, 20 hours already, had a uh, stopover in India. So we arrived at half past six in the morning, couldn't get into the hotel. Did the deepest, darkest Bangkok, which was an interesting experience, but it didn't take long to feel like a complete fish out of water. We looked completely different to the rest of the people around us. We didn't know how to cross the street. It was amazing that we survived the experience, to be honest, but we looked completely different. We stood out like sore thumbs. I'd never felt more of a tourist in my entire life than I did right there. Now, imagine that being your experience, or maybe imagine the experience of uh, setting up and packing up your life and moving to somewhere like China or India, which is culturally very, very different to where we live in the United Kingdom. Imagine that. Imagine how different it would be for you and how imagine, imagine how different you would feel to the culture around you. Imagine how much you would stick out like a sore thumb if you packed up and you moved to China. Paul is saying this is exactly what our lives should look like when we become believers in Christ. When we become believers in Christ. He's even saying this, he's revealing this is what the life should look like to believers in Colossae. People who perhaps had never set foot out of the kind of three cities that were within a, a day's travel of where they lived. So you had Colossae, you had Laodicea, which is another name that would be familiar to us from the book of Revelation. And there was another city called Hierapolis. All within, you know, there were kind of a triangle of cities that were within a couple of miles of each other. And many people who lived in Colossae at the time, maybe even members of this church, had never lived outside of those three cities. Maybe never been outside of those three cities or and the surrounding countryside so their families that they grew up in would have blended in seamlessly with the local culture but now everything has changed because they're now in Christ they have a new address and their life and the life that they are to live is to look as radically different as our life would live would look if we picked it up and put it down in the middle of rural China somewhere Paul is saying all of this uh, is saying this because of what has happened, because of who they've been born again to be in Christ. Even though they may have lived in Colossae in their, for their whole lives, there should be now be something about the way that they live that marks them out as not from around these parts. So in verses 1 to 4, Paul explores how this new life and this new address 
the in Christ address, this new identity is rooted in Christ. And it's rooted and connected with every stage of Jesus' journey from his incarnation through to his ascension to heaven and through to his sure and certain return to earth. Paul just kind of mixes up the order that we might be used to. You know, he doesn't start with the incarnation. He starts in a different place. He says this in verse 1. He says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So Paul's going to start with the ascension. He's going to start with the fact that Jesus is now in heaven. He has ascended to heaven. He's taken his place at the right hand of the Father. And what this reveals to us is that when Jesus rose from the dead, those in Christ rose with him. Not bodily, but spiritually. When we put our faith and we put our trust in Jesus and we accept salvation in him, we're born again. We're made a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And there is a new life in us that is birthed in each of us in that moment. Just as Jesus was raised physically to new life, we're raised spiritually to new life in him. And Paul reminds us, because our identity is now in Christ, when Jesus ascended to heaven and took his, right, uh, took his seat at the right hand of God, which is a metaphorical way of saying Jesus is now in a position where all authority and all rule is given to him. It's a rule of, it's a, the, being at the right hand of a ruler, being at the right hand of a king, is a position of power, a position of authority. And this is the place that Jesus now occupies. All authority in, on earth and in heaven is given to him. And when Jesus ascended to that place, those in Christ went with him. Where he goes, we now go. Paul writes it slightly differently in his letter to the church at Ephesus when he says this in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, we are all already in heaven. Just as as our true identity is already in Christ, our true home is already in heaven where Christ is. So naturally, Paul then goes on to say, because that's where your home is, because that's where your identity is, seek the things that are above. Seek the things of heaven. Seek the things that are above. Seek the things where Christ is seated. Where is Christ seated? Christ is in heaven. What are we to seek? The things of heaven. And verse 2, Paul contrasts the things that are above with the things that are on the earth. So we might rightly ask, what are the things above? What are these things of heaven then, if Paul is asking us to seek them? Well, Paul, I think he actually appropriately kind of leaves this open-ended because who, could, who of us could actually hope to describe with adequate language the things of heaven? Who could hope to capture it all in our, in our language, in our earthly language? But at the very least, it must mean the wonder of spending time with Jesus and it's from that place of his presence that all other good things flow. Everything else good flows out of the place where he is. After all, what is it that makes heaven heaven? What is it that makes heaven heaven? It's the presence of God. It's the presence of God that makes heaven heaven. And Paul is calling, calling us to set our mind on the things that flow from the presence of God, from the place where Jesus is, to meditate on them, to value them, to prioritize them, and crucially, to let them influence and shape our lives here on earth. The question that arises then is, is Paul calling us to some kind of Christian escapism? Christian escapism. After all, we've probably all experienced things in our life that we'd rather not experience, I would imagine. We can look around the world and we can see things like evil. We can see the brokenness in us and in other people. We can see the anxiety that pervades everything that seems to be happening in society at the moment. And naturally, we might want some relief from that. So we'll do things, won't we? Like we'll go to the cinema or we'll watch that new series on Netflix or we'll open a book or we'll book a holiday or whatever it may be. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking an hour or two out of the everyday grind of things and uh, engaging in those leisure activities. But we would probably all agree that if we were constantly doing that, there's something unhealthy going on inside of us. We're not living in the real world. So are we in danger of doing the same thing, falling into the same trap, if we are constantly setting our mind on the things above? Are we, as some like to put it, in danger of becoming so heavenly-minded that we're no earthly good? Anybody ever heard that saying before? Definitely heard that one before. So, 
And I think there can be a danger of getting caught up in chasing experience. You know, we've been so blessed, I think, in this church to have some incredible experiences over the last few Sundays as we've gathered together and we've worshipped and just the sense of God's presence has been so raw and so powerful and they've been incredible experiences and it makes you feel good, you know, and that's a good thing and it should. <laughs> um, but you can get caught up in a pattern of chasing after experiences, becoming almost like a, a Christian tourist who goes around from place to place, chasing experience, going to the left, going to the right, going wherever God is reported to be moving and chasing an experience that makes us feel good, makes, the, makes us feel good about ourselves or whatever else it may be. So there is that danger, but we just need to keep ourselves fixed and focused on Jesus if we feel like we're falling into that place. How do we avoid slipping into that? We go back to the source. We go back to Jesus. We fix ourselves on him. And what did Jesus do when he walked the earth? How did he pray? Well, he prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that isn't just some hopeful plea. That should be the battle cry of the church on earth as it is in heaven, should be the battle cry of the church. In other words, as we develop and cultivate a heaven-first perspective, as we set our minds on the things above, as Paul puts it, the result should be that we catch the culture of heaven, we catch the culture of the kingdom of God, and we extend that culture and the value and the priorities and the beauty of heaven into the earth around us through the way that we live through the decisions that we make, through the things that we choose to value, through the things that we choose to prioritize, through the cultures we choose to cultivate in our lives and those around us as well. So far from being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, what Paul is calling us to and into is telling us to set our mind on the things above so we become heavenly focused that we might make an earthly difference. C.S. Lewis remarked on the work of people like William Wilberforce. Anybody know William Wilberforce was uh, one of the foremost um, British politicians who ended up uh, putting an end to the slave trade in this country and led to that being outlawed in other countries as well. And um, C.S. Lewis said this about him and those other men and women who led that charge. He said, they left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. He went on to write, aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. I think there's a lot of truth in that. And that's exactly what Paul is calling us into and the people at Colossae into when he says, set your mind on those things above, not on the things of earth. And in doing that, I think he's actually he's just picking up the same teaching that Jesus gave us. In Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in verse 19. He said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, don't get hung up chasing the things of this world. Recognize what we have in Christ. In chapter 1 of Colossians, Paul reminds us of just who Jesus is in that wonderful passage that is perhaps maybe even the formation or the foundation of an early Christian hymn, um, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, he reminds us, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's the sustainer of all things. He's the author of all things, both the old and the new. He's the head of the church. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the reconciler of all things. He is victorious over all powers. This is the treasure that Paul reminds his readers of. Forget the false teachers and those who offer you other things. Forget the lesser things that the world offers you as well. Jesus is the prize. Jesus is the treasure. Jesus is the prize. And he gave himself freely to all those who believe in him and put their faith in him. Paul goes on in, in verse 3 to say, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And I think that's a wonderful reminder that as Christians, as new creations, we're dead to that old way of living. We're dead to that old way of living. And we have been raised to new life in Christ, a new way of living in him. And not only that, but we are hidden with Christ in God. Well, what does that mean? It means we're secure in him. It means we're secure in him. It means that we are held by him. And though we can't see it, we can take it on faith. I'm so glad 
that my salvation doesn't depend upon me. <laughs> my security does not depend upon me. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad of that point. There's a story of an early church father called John Chrysostom. Many may have heard of him. He was an early, one of the, as I said, one of the early church fathers. He's actually served as the Archbishop of Constantinople between uh, 398 and 404 BC. Unfortunately for John, his um, independence and fierce loyalty to Christ didn't go down so well as so often is the case with the empress at the time, a lady called Eudoxia, who wanted to assert more authority over the church and, and she actually ended up dragging John before her and threatening him in all kinds of different ways. And there, the conversation that was had between them was reported to go a little something like this. Firstly, Eudoxia tried to threaten John with banishment and he replied, you cannot banish me for the world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the empress. No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ and God, replied the archbishop. Then I'll take away your treasure. No, you cannot, for my treasure's in heaven. My heart is there. But I'll drive you away from your friends. You'll have no one left. No, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom no one can separate me. I defy you, for there's nothing you can do to harm me. There's nothing you can do to harm me. You can't fault his logic nor his courage, I think. <laughs> But notice, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't actually deny the threats that Eudoxia is making against him. He doesn't deny that they're real, that she has the power to do this. He just has right perspective. He just understands that they're set against the backdrop of what he has and who he has in Christ. And that nobody, nobody, nobody can take that out of his hand. Nobody can take that away from him because he is hidden with Christ. He is secured in Christ. In that old hymn, Before the Throne of God, the hymn writer Charity Lee's Bancroft captured the reality of what it means to be secure in Christ in these wonderful words of that final verse. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. So we can't see that we are hidden, but even though we can't see it, we know that we're secure in Christ because we can take it on faith. But it's interesting to note, I think, that this isn't the first time in his letter that Paul uses this word hidden. We've actually come across it a couple of times already in our studies. So in chapter 1, verse 26, he reminds us that the mystery hidden for ages and generations is now revealed to his saints. The mystery that was hidden has now been revealed, and the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in chapter 2, verse 3, he says this, to paraphrase, in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The implication being that for those who are in Christ, now you have access to all of those treasures and of wisdom and knowledge. They were hidden, but now they're revealed and they're available in their fullness to everybody who is in Christ. The point being that when Paul uses the phrase hidden, there's always a revealing that comes in Christ. There's always a revealing that comes in Christ. And this stands in stark opposition to what was happening in the culture around the church at Colossae at the time. Remember how we talked about these mystery cults, these pagan cults that were shout, shrouded in secrecy, where you had to go through these different levels of initiation to find out more, to get the secret knowledge, to get the important knowledge, so that you could lord it over other people? Paul's saying the exact opposite here. He's saying, you get it all with Jesus. There's no more secrets. There's no more hiding. With Jesus, everything is included. Everything that was hidden is now revealed in Christ. Not to just a few select people, but to everybody. To everybody who is in Christ, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are now yours because they are thrown in with him. And unlike those mystery cults who keep those things and those people who fall under their sway shrouded in darkness... In Christ, the hidden things, all of them, are revealed and we are brought out from darkness and into light. Remember how Paul writes about us being gloriously transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light in Christ. For Paul says, your life is hidden with Christ in God, but when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, our lives are hidden with Christ, but there is a time coming when they will be revealed in all of their glory. When Jesus returns to the earth, it'll be a, a day like, unlike any day that we've ever experienced in any part of our lives. 
unlike a day that will ever happen again in all of history. For those in Christ, which is you, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus and you've received that free gift of salvation and offer in him, it will be the most incredible moment. Paul describes it like this in another of his letters to the church at Corinth. He puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. We'll appear with Christ in glory. That coming glory means a removal of all of those things that distort us, that harm us, that break us, all of those things that cause us to experience suffering and pain and anguish. They're all gone when Christ appears because with him comes our glory. With him comes our glorification. And there is no fear or doubt expressed by what Paul says here because our coming glory is not dependent upon our ability to make ourselves acceptable or sprucing ourselves up or by making ourselves worthy in any way, if that were even possible. No, this glory is brought about by Christ himself when he returns. And in the meantime, we wait. We wait. But there's two types of waiting. There's two types of waiting. So there's rainy day waiting and there's house guest waiting. There's rainy day waiting and there's house guest waiting. So rainy day waiting is passive. Rainy day waiting is passive. Did you ever have those experiences where, as a child, perhaps it was school holiday time and you just really wanted to be outside playing? You know, I, my children maybe want to spend so much more time inside looking at screens and we have to drag them outside. But when I was young, and I'm sure when you were young as well, for most of you, your experience would have been that you just wanted to be outside. You wanted to be outside either kicking a ball or climbing a tree or exploring some, something somewhere and playing with your friends. But when it was raining, you just sat and you looked out the window and you willed the rain to stop, hoping that the sun would come out so that you could go out and spend time with your friends. But there was nothing to do while you waited. So you just waited, bored, rainy day waiting, looking out the window, bored out of your brain. That's what rainy day waiting looks like. House guest waiting is dramatically different. House guest waiting is not passive, it is active. If you've, I don't know if your experience is like mine in my house, when we have a house guest, it's very active. Because there's a lot of cleaning up to do in our house with three small children, as you might imagine. But when you're waiting the arrival of the house guests, particularly if it's somebody who you're very, very fond of, maybe it's a best friend that you've not seen in years, maybe it's a close family member who you've not had the opportunity to see for a really long time, when you're awaiting the arrival of somebody like that, you're not passive, are you? You're active. You're actively cleaning up the house. You're actively perhaps thinking about all of their favorite things, thinking, oh, well, what do they like to eat? What do they like to drink? I'll make sure that I have those in stock. I'll make sure that I'm really well stocked up on some of this stuff. I'll go out to the shop. I'll prepare these things. I'll make sure the coffee on. I'll make sure there's some fresh bread in the house. I'll put out fresh flowers. I'll maybe even cook their favorite meal. And I'll definitely make sure that we have a bottle of something cold in the fridge, ready to enjoy when they arrive. Unsurprisingly, it's this second kind of waiting that fits better with our picture while we wait for Jesus's return. Because Jesus has shared the values and the priorities of heaven with us. It's only natural that we want to share those with those around us as part of the preparation for his return. And we can wait in confidence and security, not fear or anxiety, because we're in Christ. And because we're in Christ, our waiting's not passive, it's active. When we know who we are in Christ, we'll be energized and we'll be inspired and we will be empowered to transform where we're at, at Lincoln, at Colossae, at wherever you may be, to look more like what he has shown us. The way we wait should reflect the fact that Jesus has not called us to hope in the promises of heaven and live in a broken world, but rather he has called us to live in the promises of heaven that we might bring hope to a broken world. And um, Bill, I don't know if you can put the slide up that just gives us a, 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 there's a diagram that maybe helps us understand everything that Paul's just taken us through in those first four verses. I don't know if you've got that slide for us in there somewhere, Bill. We should have a diagram. There we go. Just helps us visualize what Paul, the journey that Paul has taken, on, taken us on so that we might understand our new identity, our new home. It's in Christ. It's in Christ. And everything that we've just looked at, all of those four verses and all of the identity formation that Paul has just done in those four verses as he's just chained us into every part of Christ's journey, 
sets the context for what Paul says next. It helps us understand to what he's calling us to and what he's not calling us to as we read these next few scriptures. Because everything that Paul has just been doing has been unfolding our Christian identity to us. Who we are because of who Christ has made us to be. Now, he will add to this Christian lifestyle. How we are to live in light of who Christ has made us to be. And through this next section, Paul actually, he'll rock back a little bit between Christian identity and Christian lifestyle. And when Paul is addressing Christian lifestyle, we should see this for what it is. This is a call to live out your true identity. It's be who you have been created to be. It's, as he writes elsewhere, live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. It's be who you have been born again to be, not, as some have mistakenly thought, a do this or else. This is not a do this or else. This is not a threat that Paul is writing here. It is an exhortation. It is an encouragement to bring your lifestyle into alignment with your identity. Now, having said that, Paul's language is really strong because he starts by saying, put to death. It doesn't really get much stronger than that, does it? Kill this, kill it. That's pretty strong. Now, as we mentioned previously, any time we see a therefore, and that's what we see after this put to death, put to death therefore, we should make sure that we look at what has preceded it. And what we've already seen is what has preceded this, therefore, is the reminder that we are in union with Christ. We are in union with Christ. We are in Christ. So that is our identity. So it is entirely appropriate for Paul to use such strength of language about behaviors, about lifestyle, about decisions, about things that we may do that are not in keeping with the character of Christ. And Paul identifies these things that we must put to death as earthly things, things that are not from above, but things are, that are of the earth. He then lists five of these things, and what he's employing here is, is a, it's a literary pattern you actually see quite a lot of in contemporary uh, writing of the time. So often um, writers would include vice lists, such as we see here, and often they'd include two. Um, first, you get something that's a bit more obvious, like our first list here, and then you get something that's maybe a little less obvious, like our second list that we'll come to in a moment. But it's important to remember that these lists were never exhaustive. It's not like these are all of the things that Paul is calling people to deal with. They're just examples, and they may have been pertinent, particularly pertinent examples for the church at Colossae, but they were neither unintentional. And Paul picks these particular things for a reason. And when we consider these five things, we'll see that they represent deep and seemingly irresistible forces that affect every single one of us in different ways. So firstly, he says sexual immorality. And this is a broad term that covers all sexual activity outside of marriage. What makes it immoral is that God has prescribed the container in which sexual activity should take place. In our culture today, we've kind of made the only container that um, sexual activity should take place in is mutual consent of adults. That's enough for us, and we're happy with that, and that's the only boundary of sexual activity. But for God, who is the creator of sex and who gave clear instructions for when sex should be enjoyed, the maker's instructions for how it should work ought to carry weight. That's what Paul's writing. And ultimately, this comes down to authority. It's all about authority. For, these, uh, for those in Christ, Paul is saying we should submit to the authority of God, the creator and designer of sex, and follow his instructions and put to death all sexual activity that sits outside of the creator's design. Paul then goes on to talk about impurity. And this is, this is linked to sexual immorality, but it's broader. It extends into a kind of living that's profligate. Think sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that kind of lifestyle. This kind of lifestyle is self-indulgent. It's the kind of life that we lead to feed our own desires. But Paul says it makes us unclean before God. It stains our clothes. Then he talks about passions or lust. And we all know what that looks like, I think. It's a self-centered, me-focused attitude that's all about getting what we can get to satisfy our earthly desires. And at its core, lust is the opposite of love. Lust is the opposite of love because it's all about self-gratification instead of self-sacrifice. And on the surface, lust can actually look quite a lot like love because there is desire there. It's just not a desire for the other person. It's a desire for the filling of our own selfish desires. It's kind of love taken and twisted and reversed in action. And it, lust is a desire for self and a fulfilling of one's own desires that cares nothing for the welfare of the object of that lust. Fourthly, Paul says 
he talks about evil desires, and he continues to kind of draw this circle wider with this one. And it refers to any time that we might place the pursuit of our fulfillment over the interests and desires of anybody else. We might place our own interests, our own desires, over and above, and perhaps more importantly, at the expense of the well-being of others. And finally, he talks about covet covetousness or greed. And this is the ultimate expression of selfishness. This applies to every area of our lives that we see. Um, that we see that line of selfishness kind of threaded through each of these five areas. In fact, it, co it comes up. And Paul says of this one, it's idolatry. He's revealing at its heart, greed will always lead to us replacing God with ourselves. We stop worshipping God, and we instead we feed our stomachs, we feed our bank balance, we feed our sexual appetites to take and get whatever we want because we've stopped trusting God to provide what we need, and we've become worshippers of ourselves. And Paul then goes on to say, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now that's not some threat to motivate the Colossians to clean up their act, to reform their ways. It's simply a way of saying that these sins point to what's wrong with the world and help us understand why God is coming and why it's a good thing that God is coming to deal with these things. Perhaps in reading this list, it might confirm some people's worst fears that Christians are obsessed with this kind of thing. I think it's, it, it, if you kind of experience that as a question, maybe, or um, maybe you've, you've heard that kind of thinking before, I think it would be really simple to ask. I think it's useful to, to ask this question. What's it like to be the object and therefore the victim of each one of these lists? What's it like to be the object of somebody else's lust? What's it like to be the object of somebody else's greed? What's it like to be the victim of somebody else's evil desires? It's not good. It's not nice. That's why Paul insists that all of that way of living is incompatible with being a Christian. It's behavior that stems from another identity. It's not behavior that's rooted in Christ. It's behavior that's rooted in our old identity that's supposed to be dead and buried. It's behavior that's rooted in the earth and not from the things above. And Paul says, this, we've got to put this stuff to death. That means we've got to analyze our motives behind the decisions that we make. It means fleeing from those situations that put us into temptation. I think that's a really important thing to remember. Paul writes this uh, to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 2, 22. That's a lot of twos. He says this, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So many times I think you hear, don't you, people saying, the devil's out to get me, the devil's out to get me. But really, it's because we've lingered too long in a place we ought not be. It's because we've lingered too long in the presence of temptation instead of doing what the word of God teaches us to do, which is to flee, to flee, to get as far away from it as we can, to come out of that place where we're tempted. Paul is calling us to put these things to death. But here's the point. He's saying we don't put these things to death out of fear. Because fear is what religion breeds. Fear is what comes out of trying to keep the rules. We do it out of confidence because we've already been united with Christ. We do it to bring our lifestyle into alignment with our identity, not the other way around. And Paul, to help us keep this right perspective of, uh, and this right posture of humility, he then reminds us, in case we were prone to looking outside of ourselves and judging those around us, in these you too walked when you were living in them, but now you've got to put them all away. They belong to an old way of living. You know, in the early church, when they did baptisms, they were a bit different to ours. One of the things they did that was slightly differently to ours is that before they were baptized, the people, they would take off their old clothes. And then they go and be baptized, and when they've been baptized, they put on a set of new clothes. It was that further visible sign an exterior sign of what was happening on the inside, a further sign of that transformation. And what happens on the inside, what happens at the heart level, is what really determines our transformation. We cannot change from the outside in, but only from the inside out. And that can only happen when we surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us. But one of the first evidences of that change will often come in how we talk. Anybody else had that experience? I could certainly testify to that for myself that when I was, uh, finally gave my life to Christ and accepted him, that one of the first things to change in me was the way that I talked. Jesus said, it's not 
what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your mouth, the words you speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Paul's next list, this slightly more minor list it might look like on the surface, is actually a list of vices that's most often manifest through the words that we speak. He talks about anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk. I don't know if anybody ever remembers that saying. Maybe, again, you heard it when you were a kid. Sticks and stones may break, the bone, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I remember trotting that one out a few occasions when uh, other children said something either not nice about me or one of my siblings or my parents or something like that. And I understand the, you know, the sentiment in that, and there's truth in it to a degree, but there's also, it's not true, because words do hurt. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of anger or wrath or malicious words or slanderous words or obscene talk, it can hurt. It can hurt, can't it? when you receive one of these verbal assaults. No wonder then that Paul says, along with lying, you need to put these things off. Put off the old self with all of its old practices and put on the new, which is being renewed in the image of its creator. And that's a great reminder that it's God that does the work. It's God that does the work. We're just yielding ourselves to that work. Uh, I want to just ask Kev and Chris to come back and we'll just prepare to worship as we get ready to close. I think... It's really important in all of this that we've just looked at, particularly these verses from 5 to 10, that we've just looked at. What we must remember here is Paul is not doing what he's just told the Colossians to be wary about. He is not giving them a list of rules to follow. He is not giving them a list of rules to follow. Okay, This is not about a rule set that we have to keep in order that we might be accepted, in order that we might experience transformation. He's already told us at the end of chapter 2 that self-made religion has no power to transform. What he is doing is reminding the believers at Colossae and, here, and us here today who Christ has made us to be and how we should live in the light of that reality. What Paul's done so far is to remind us of our new address, who we are in Christ, that, that is our identity. And then he's begun to talk about our wardrobe. He's to, begun to talk about the clothes that we wear, our lifestyle. So far, he's described the old clothes that were part of the lifestyle that we used to live outside of Christ and how we are to put those clothes off. And next time, we'll begin to look at this new wardrobe that Christ has given us to wear, the clothes of that new lifestyle that he calls us to live that flow out of our new identity that he's given to us. But in all things, we rem must remember that how we live is to flow out of who Christ has made us to be. It's actually the only way we will ever live a life that is authentic and consistent with the faith that we profess. I think it's so easy for us, isn't it, in the society that we live in, the culture that we live in, in a Western capitalist society that tells us that we're to judge our value and our worth and our purpose by what we do, for us to get wrapped up with a perspective about who we are and look at how we live to be the evidence of our identity. We see it in the world all around us, don't we? What I do for a living, what I do with my body, what I feel in my mind is my identity. But the truth for the Christian is the polar opposite. My identity is not found in anything I have done, said, think or felt. It's found in Christ. It's found in Christ and what he has done, and what he has said, and who he has made me to be. And because my identity is rooted in him, it is secured in him, and it's not dependent on my performance. So as a Christian, my lifestyle does not set my identity. Instead, my identity shapes my lifestyle, so that my lifestyle comes into alignment with my true identity, and not the other way around. And it's only in this way that the image of Christ can be revealed more and more and more in each of us. As I yield myself to the work of the Holy Spirit to reveal that image, I also position myself. We all position ourselves to be able to pray with, cert with a certain expectation, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you for what you have done. Lord, we praise you for who you have graciously made us to be. Lord, we thank you for that free gift of salvation that we could never earn and never deserve, but Lord, you delighted to bestow on each of us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did at the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you made it possible for us to take up residence at a new address 
that you have given us a new identity, that you've given us a new set of clothes to put on. And Lord Jesus, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would help each of us live from that secure place of knowing that our identity is not found in what we do, what we say, what we think, or how we may feel, but it's found in you. It's found in the finished work of the cross. It's found in your blood that speaks a better word over every single one of us. And it's from that place of secure identity in in you, Lord, that we are liberated to live a life that is worthy of the calling that we have received. We are empowered to let go of those things of earth and set our mind on the things above, to put off the old and to put on the new to step into that image that is being renewed by you, Lord, each day in us. Lord, would you help us by your spirit to yield to your work in every area of our lives. We lay it all down before you this evening. Come and have your way with every part of our lives and bring it into alignment with who you have made us to be, that we might be bearers of your image and that you may produce in us, Lord, that image that takes us from glory to glory to glory as you unfurl in each of us, as you unveil in each of us, Lord, the image of your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your work. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask that you bless it to each of our hearts now, in Jesus' name. Amen.